long time. And I'm interested to see what the message, just three words, what he's going to preach on today. And uh, I tell you, it's um, um, never, never easy when you go, uh, when you come in or when you go as a pastor. Um, I'm thankful that um, Dr. Lewis poured, Dr. Lewis and his wife, Miss Vicki, they poured their hearts and their lives into this church. And many of you all have been saved and God has uh, blessed you, you members of the church. And then uh, you can go ahead and serve the Lord uh, because of God using Dr. Lewis. And I'm thankful that many years ago when the church called them from Florida, they answered the phone. Amen. Dr. Lewis, you come and preach for us, Dr. Lewis. I believe it. <laughs> well, I do have a message. <laughs> Amen, Dr. Lewis. Amen. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. Yes, sir, Dr. Lewis. Thank you for the good singing today. Thank you for the opportunity we have to close out five years here, and we're excited about it. You're going to learn about those three words in just a moment or so, but I want you to take your Bible with me to Luke chapter number five, Luke chapter number five, and we're going to be reading in there in verse number 12 if we get started, and i uh, if you got a hanky, you just wave it at me, you know, and you got to wipe your eyes, I'll wipe mine. And uh, you still remember that joke, right? It's a dancing handkerchief. <laughs> Here it is, all right? Why is it a dancing handkerchief? Because it's got a little boogie in it. <laughs> Mine's probably got some in it, I don't know. But if you have to wipe your eyes, you have to smile and uh, just look and see what the Lord has for us today. And like I said, I enjoy the kids being here and singing and all the fellowship and the dinner and food's been provided. We have the best dining hall in Washington Courthouse. We do, folks. It is. And if you leave without eating, shame on you. You're all invited to stay and have. And I'm excited about the afternoon service, too. I, I usually take a nap in the afternoon, so I'm going to do it in the afternoon service. <laughs> that would be good when Brother Pinson preaches but in this chapter, we're going to look at just three words. I want to read the text. We'll have a word of prayer, and then we'll get started. And verse number 12 says this, And it came to pass, when he was in a certain city, behold, a man full of leprosy, who, seeing Jesus, fell on his face and besought him, saying, Lord, if thou will, thou can makest me clean. And he put forth his hand, and touched him. Aren't you glad God touches you? Amen. And saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately the leprosy departed from him. And he charged him to tell no man, but go and show thyself to the priest and offer for thy cleansing according as Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. But so much the more went there a fame abroad of him and great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities. And he withdrew himself into the wilderness and prayed. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that we're not in the wilderness. Amen. We know you and we're in good company. And so, Lord, I pray that you would anoint this message with your power and your presence Help me to say what I need to say, and then, Lord, help us all to receive what we need. Thank you for these that are here. For these things, I pray for your glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. A message like this I sent to my mom several years ago. I mean, several years ago. She used to get my message every week. I put on cassette tape the message, the title. She picked up the message in the mail looked at it and said, just three words. She goes, I know what those are. That is, I love you. And I said, no, Mom, that's not it. <laughs> that, that wasn't the message, I love you. But how do you know? How do you know if somebody loves you? How do you know? They give you their time. Amen. You have given me your time Amen. for five years. And we have given you our time for five years. Think about that. That's love, folks. But that's not the message. That's just uh, appreciation. 
that you have showed up. And the best thing you could do for a preacher is to show up. Listen, give him your time. And in the future, I trust this church will take off, go skyrocketing because you spend time not only here, but in the Word of God. So what can we gain from this message? Just three words. I want to get back to it in just a little bit, the text. But before we do, God's big on words. I mean, it is important to him, all right? Matthew 4, 4 says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded from the mouth of God. Every word. Now, listen, not some words, not the words you want to hear, not the ones you pick and choose. Every word of God that proceeds from his mouth is what God says I want you to live on. So, in case if you're wondering, that's the Bible. I know. If you've been here any length of time, you know you don't have to figure it out. I'm a Bibleist. You say, what's that? I believe the Bible, all right? And we preach the Bible. So the idea is this. Here's what? 66 books, 39 in the old, 27 in the new, 1,189 chapters. I said it right. 31,102 verses, 788,400 or 280 words. So God, what do you mean? Every word yeah, 788,280 words. Amen. Uh, every word. That's how you're supposed to live your life. So words are important. The average person spends, I don't know why that's on the screen up there, by the way, but you can erase it if you can. Here's the average person uses words that I use to use for no good. But here's the idea, folks. How much time do you spend talking it all depends on what gender you are. Are you with me? You say, what do you mean? He says, what's your pronoun? There's only two in the Bible, folks, male and female, amen? You don't have to go guessing about it. So the average person spends one-fifth of their time talking. That's five hours a day. Wow, that's a lot of talking. Somebody asked me one time, does that upset you when your wife gets the last word in? No, I'm delighted when she gets to it. <laughs> Aren't you? You say, what's the big deal? The big deal is this, words are important. I mean, think about it. The words we say every day, how important they are. Now, I have a few pet peeves according to the Word of God and what people tell us in the world. Because if you tell a lie long enough and loud enough, somebody's going to believe it, correct? And then somebody comes along and says, that's not scriptural, and they call you a liar. Don't call me a liar this morning, all right? I'm going to tell you something. You've heard me say it before. They say a picture is worth a thousand words. Really? Is that what the Bible says? Really? Who made that one up anyway? Folks, I'm just telling you, it's not in the Bible. The Bible says this in Proverbs 25 and verse number 11. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in pictures of silver. Amen. Now, pictures, by the way. I gave that verse to somebody one time and they go, oh, I thought that was pictures. Yeah, you should go back to school. <laughs> pictures. Ah, God says, a word fitly spoken is better than what pictures? Not a thousand. Not a picture's worth a thousand words. One time I was to dedicate a library, and I gave this verse and told them how, when I prayed that afternoon for the opening of the library, I said, this is it. Your words are very important. And this place is full of words. God's word is important. And so, when we speak about a word, how important is it? How about John 3.16? Is that pretty important? For God gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I think that's pretty good words, don't you? Tim Tebow thought so, too. Oh, this is where the rubber meets the road. You say, is he a Christian? He was a homeschooler, a missionary's kid. And he thought 
he came up with this idea of putting this verse underneath his eyes, and he came up with it that Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. And he thought that was great. People were getting great reviews. People were watching him and seeing those things under his eyes. They blacked him out. He was a quarterback for Florida, by the way. And then he got promoted into the NFL for a short time. And he played for the Denver Broncos. But just before that, he had decided, I'm going to change that. God wants me to change it. So he changed Philippians 4.13 to John 3.16. So every time the game camera got on, if you're the quarterback and you win the national championship, people are going to go, hey, that's, that's a good thing, John 3.16. But do you know that God had even bigger things in store? When he was in the NFL, he played this lowly team, Pittsburgh Steelers. <laughs> And he, and he played them. And it was, a, it was a divisional game to win. And he put John 3.16 on there. And the guy that was his promoter or took care of his finances and all that came up to him after the game and said, and it was a miraculous game. And if you ever heard the story about 3.16, you would be amazed. He had, he had everything was 3.16. You have to look at it sometime. But they said, Nearly a hundred million people tuned in to that game and, and Googled John 3.16. Now you tell me a better picture than that. Right? And to his amazement, he said, who in the world doesn't know what John 3.16 is? Our world's in trouble, folks. But they Googled it. They said, we got to know what John 3.16 is. And you've seen it before. People hold them up during athletic contests, letting people know that they're a believer and they should be too. Well, I don't know. I like John 3.16. I like Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Are you with me? A table out here, presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I want to tell you what, those words are important. So, just three words. That's what we want to look at. Do you know the, the, the implication of just one word? If somebody came into your house and they said, do you want me to shoot you? You only need one answer, right? <laughs> one word. No. No. The implication, no. Don't shoot me. Yes. Go ahead. You're dead. You see the implications of just one word? So when we're talking about Jesus speaking three words, we realize we have power because we know the Word of God. We can help other people with our words. And I, I just think many times we ought to tell people, I love you. What do you think? Just three words. We should tell them things like, thank you. Just a couple words. How about uh, good job? Don't quit. Just do it. Keep it up. Keep looking up. Oh, those are pretty good words, right? Have a great day. Just a few words, folks. What I'm telling you, how they can lift somebody's spirit and how they can get them through the day when somebody just says, I think you're the one that can do this. I believe in you. Just words. And Jesus is full of words. He gave us the Bible, like I told you, so many words. Why don't we realize a careless word may kindle strife, a cruel word may wreck a life, a bitter word may hate and steal, a brutal word may what? Smite and kill. A gracious word may smooth the way, a joyous word may lighten the day, a timely word may lessen stress, a loving word may heal and bless. Now back to our text. There in Luke chapter 5, verse number 13, Jesus 
was and is the proper source. Whatever you're thinking about, he is the proper source. I want you to look there in verse number 13 with me once again and notice this. And you're just going to see this full of God's word. It says, and he put forth his hand and touched him saying, I will, three words, be thou clean. It didn't take him a whole bulk. It didn't take him all day long. It was just three words, be thou clean. And immediately the leprosy departed from him. Wow. In verse number 12, if you go back a verse, once again, it came to pass when he was in a certain city. Listen, he didn't name the city, but he did tell us it was a certain city. It was a real place. There was a man with real leprosy. This is not some fairy tale. Real leprosy. This was a man who probably had tried every remedy there was given. He probably watched the YouTube and saw all those scams. He probably said, this is how you get rid of it. It didn't work. He came to Jesus. He says, if thou will, what, what did he recognize? He recognized he was the proper source. If you want to get healed, you go to the proper source, the great physician. And so he goes to him and says, if I got to have this healing now. You know a little bit about leprosy? It's not pleasant, folks. You walk around saying, unclean, unclean. I've seen a lot of people with masks on lately doing that. Don't you follow me? Unclean. I, okay, I'll take your word for it. You're unclean. Uh, I need to be protected from you instead of you being protected from me, right? The idea is that you start losing feeling all over. Your, your feelings go out. You lose part of your limbs. You, it disfigures you. And, and this one time, there's a camp of people they were having, they were roasting some potatoes in the fire, and one fell off into the, in the burning flame, and the man with leprosy, leprosy went over there and pulled it up like it was nothing. And the guy goes, wow, how'd you do that? I've lost touch. I don't have no feelings. He said, what would I give to have some feelings? What would you do if you lost all your feelings, all your emotions, all your health? Leprosy is a type that we look at sin. When God looked at us, he said, all of our righteousness is as filthy rags. It's sinful, ugly, putrefying, smelling. They'd scrape themselves and the stench would be so bad, nobody would want to be around them. And God said, I know you're in bad shape. Don't you know one day God saw you and just rang your bell and said, you're in bad shape. But I'm not going to turn from you. I'm going to touch you. And I'm going to clean you up. How does he clean us up? He forgives us of all of our sins that we've ever committed and ever will commit and washes us whiter than snow in his precious blood. And he made that sacrifice for us so heaven could be our home. And one day we're going to be dancing in glory. And if we're free, we're free. Whatever was there that was messing with us, there's no more chains on us. There's no more sickness, no more sorrow, no more death, no more pain, no more crying. It's all going to be going. Why? Why? Because he is the proper source. Now, when you look at this, you think, okay, God, I know you're, you've got just three words there, be thou clean, but he's got three more words. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. Is that correct? He is the way. And somebody says this, some, they'll say, well, he is a way. He's not a way. He is the only way. He said, I am the way, the truth. He personified truth. He, if you want to know the truth, you got to get it from the Word of God because you're not getting it from our Congress. You're not getting it from our higher-ups. You're not getting it in this world. You get it from God. And if you want to know life and life more abundantly, you've got to come to the right source. And the right source is the Lord Jesus Christ. The same story is told to us in Matthew and in Mark. He had compassion on him, and he said, Be thou clean. Aren't you glad his compassions fail not? And his faithfulness is there through all generations. I am. He is the proper 
source. But not only that, he's the proper force. Oh, you should have been here Wednesday night. We talked about UFOs. Man, may the force be with you. Star Wars. May the force be with you. Well, I know what the force is. It's not just some higher power, folks. It's God. Somebody said, what was God doing before he was God? Nothing. He was God. We don't know what he was doing. before. There was no time before God. He was before time. He was before space. He was before all that that is given to us. And he had to be outside of all those to be God. So he is the proper force. Matthew 28, 18, he said about Jesus, said this. He said, all power is given to me in heaven and in earth. The word Jehovah for one of his names means all-powerful. Just three words. Oh, you say, what happened in creation? What did God say? Let there be. Three words. Let there be light. Let there be earth. Let there be cattle. Let there be just three words. Let there be. When God says let there be, you can mark it down. He's got to, you're in the right place because he's got the right power. But not only that, remember the soldiers that came to him in the garden? And if you didn't know, there was three bands. There was 200 in a band. There was 600, and they weren't a rock band, by the way, okay? That was just bands, Roman ones. They came, there's 600, and they go, are you Jesus? And he says, I am. Him, he. <laughs> they all fell down. Man, I'd like to have that power, wouldn't you? I want the force to be with me. Somebody says, I don't like you, and I say, fall down. <laughs> just, <laughs> you know, get you. I don't have to touch you. <laughs> I just say the word. You're gone. Wow, Jesus has that. One day, you know what he's going to say to the devil? I mean, I like it. I wish I, you know, had that power, like I say, but he's going to say to the devil, why don't you join the Antichrist in hell? He's going to say, go to the pit. You know what I'm going to say? Amen. How you like that, devil? Jesus took care of you. Three words. Where the false prophet and the Antichrist has been for a thousand years, now he's going to tell Satan, why don't you join them? Have a little party down there while you're at it. And I don't, you know, if you if you think we shouldn't talk bad about the devil, you're in the wrong place. Because he is a destructive one. He's a murderer. He's a thief. He's a liar. And he wants to kill you. And so we, we talk bad about him. And I'm just joining God. I say, devil, if you don't like it here, go to hell. That's biblical. And you didn't hear me cuss. That's in the Bible, all right? And then aren't you glad on Calvary's tree, robed in blood, crowned with thorns, he's hanging there before the world, and he says, it is finished. Three words. Just three words. What's finished? Not him. He's going to be off that cross pretty soon. He's going to be in that glorified body. He's not finished. It's just beginning. He said, what did he do? He paid the price and told you there is no more costs. You don't have to pay for your salvation. If you had to pay for your salvation, you couldn't afford it. If I told you you could take a peanut and roll down the aisle a hundred times with a pencil with your mouth, that wouldn't be good enough. If I told you to cash in all the money you ever had in your life and try to buy it, that wouldn't be good enough. If I told you to try to live the best you can for all your life, that wouldn't be good enough. The only thing that's good enough is that you came to the right source. That's Jesus Christ. And he has the right force to take care of all your sins, forgive you, and give you a home in heaven. And I tell you what, I'm excited about that. But you see, death, it didn't bother him. He walked alongside of a funeral procession, and there's a mom who lost her only son, and he touches the thing, and the old guy jumps up. I watched the Ray Stevens uh, video about setting up with the dead. How would you like to have been there? If you know what I'm talking about, I'm not setting up with the dead no more when the dead start setting up, <laughs> right? 
That guy got up off that briar, and that's what they were carrying. He jumped up, and people go, whoa, that's got to be something. Yeah, when Jesus is in the room, you got the right force. You got the right source. And you know what else? When he comes to Lazarus' grave, he knew he was dead. He knew how long it had been. I'm trying to figure this out in my head. Maybe you can help me a little bit. When I was younger, I thought you had to wait three days to put somebody in the ground. I don't know why. I just thought that was customary. You visit somebody, then later on you put them in the ground three days. And, and then they, they say something to him, well, three days. They raise up the two witnesses. Three days, they raise up Jesus. So I just thought that was normal. But what's wrong with this picture? Lazarus has been dead four days, not three days. And they looked and they go, man, Jesus, he stinks by now. He's probably pretty, he's falling apart in that grave, in that tomb. Jesus says, okay, you with me? He says, just roll the stone away. And when he rolls the stone away, three words, Lazarus, it says a loud voice, by the way. He didn't go, Lazarus. Don't, you don't want a wimpy preacher, so I'm praying for you. <laughs> said, Lazarus, come forth. Amen. Wow, it's a good thing you called him by name because everybody would have come forth. Right. That grave would have opened up all over the place. So here he comes strolling out of there. They unwind him like the kids do with toilet paper on them all the time. They unwind him and they pull him out and he's alive. Hey, when he's not on time, he's on time. It may be four days late, but he was right on time. Amen. Amen. So he is the proper force. And, and when we see he's the proper source, we need to run to him. And then we see him in a boat. He's sleeping in a boat. Uh, how in the world do you sleep in a boat? And you're down there. He, must, he was human, 100% God, 100% man. He's tired. He's sleeping. And Peter has opened his mouth so many times and put his foot in it, he's not going to do it this time. So he says, John, would you go down and wake him up? <laughs> Smart, he's catching on, right? Pass it on to John. Look, they think they're going to perish. They think the storm is just all over them, and they're going to sink at any moment. But he just says, he gets up, looks around the storm. He says, peace. Be still. Just three words. And there were other ships out there traveling, and they got the benefit of all of it because the waters become soft. And those guys in the boat said, what manner of man is this? I'll tell you who he is. He's a sinless one. He's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's soon to be a king of kings and lord of lords. He was in your boat. When Jesus is in your boat, you're okay. When Jesus is in the house, you're okay because he is a proper source. He has a proper force and he wants to put you on the proper course. Go back to Luke chapter number five, if you will. And it says there, as we read in verse number, I believe it'll be 14. And he charged him, the leper that is, to tell no man, but go and show thyself to the priest and offer for thy cleansing according as Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. You see, Christianity 101. Sometimes when you're starting out with a course, you go, this is 101, this is 201, this is on down the line. This is elementary. He tells the leopard, now that you're clean, you got to go do what the Bible says. That's what it says. Leopards need to go and do what Moses said so now that you're clean that we can establish you as a clean person. Correct? That's what happens when you get baptized. You show the world that you have accepted Christ and you show a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. So this is Christianity 101. Every word that proceeded from the mouth of God, all those 788,000 words, 200 and some is what we're supposed to go listen to. So now, when he does this, he's got to go there. So what do we do? What's these words? What's this thing about being on the right course? You know, you don't want to get off course. 
If you're going, we got all these GPSs and all these things, and sometimes they'll get you off the wrong course. Somebody could give you the wrong directions. You realize if you stopped at a corner gas station and you asked somebody how to get someplace, <laughs> you got a lot of faith. He could tell you a story just like that. Go three blocks here, turn right, turn left, and then you're too so far gone, you forgot where the gas station was to go back and punch him. But the idea is, what I'm telling you is, we take advice from a lot of people who don't know what they're talking about. And so if we're going to stay the course, we got to stay in the book. And if we stay in the book, we can be on course. And 1 Peter 1.23 says, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God that liveth and abideth forever. It's not outdated. It is good. Stick with it. Don't join the crowd that changes every month that says we got to go with the culture. Stay with the book. And then in John 15, 3, it says, you are clean through the word which I have spoken. Somebody says, well, you just can't read a lot of the word of God. You got to read just a little bit and study it. Well, just get in the shower and turn it on just for two seconds. You are not going to get very clean. You read the word of God a lot and you get cleansed. He said, well, I'm already saved. Yeah, but you need to be cleansed daily because the Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all uh, sin. So we need to be cleansed of all unrighteousness. So in our unrighteous ways, we need to be cleansed. In Romans 10, 17, it says, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So the more you hear the word of God, the more faith you have to stay the course. Why do people fall away from church? Why do preachers quit? Stop reading the Bible. Testimony after testimony, I've heard it. I know one preacher quit for 10 years. I said, in what way? Well, I've heard others say this. People who are renowned on television or whatever else would say, what was your big downfall? Stop reading the Word of God. I got off course. I got off course, and so I, when I got off course, then the devil comes and messes with you, and it's hard to get back on. Sometime you're going to think that you can just sin and get away with it for a few days, and you come back whenever you want to. It's not that easy. Because once you stop going forward for God, you're going backwards, and if you've been going backwards very long, it's hard to get back. You say, I'm just a prayer away. We'll try it. God will forgive you. That doesn't mean he's going to put you right back where you were. you got to take that journey. You start sliding back this way, and you get right with God, you got to walk a ways to get back over here. So you're walking with God to get back to where you were before. Wouldn't it be great just to stay here and keep walking this way? And so you need the Word of God. In Psalms 119, verse 11, says, Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. Hide the Word of God. Memorize the Word of God. And don't let the devil take it from you. Hide it in your heart. Psalms 119, verse 105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. What is a path? It is the course that you're on. Amen. Every one of us have a, a race to run. And I've often said, Won't you stay in the race until the race is over? Don't quit. Stay in the race. So my race is not your race, my path is not your path. Of course, we're on is not the same, but we're on course. And so I got to stay on course the way God wants me to stay. And you have to go the course that God wants you to. So he is the proper source. He is what? <laughs> He's the proper force. And he tells us that we need to stay on course. And you know, these are not a lot of words, but they are precious words. Because you can't get saved until you come to the right source. If you're here and you never accepted the Lord as your Savior, you can't be born again until you come to the right source. He is the door. Here's the door of salvation. you got to come through Jesus to get to the Father. You can't come over here. You can't come over here. You can't come to the church membership. You can't come to the baptism tank. You can't come any other way. you got to go through Jesus because he's the right source. And he's the right force because he has the power not only to save you, but anything in your life that you need, don't go somewhere else. Amen. Go to God. Don't, I've heard some strange things 
When you go to a doctor and he says, how can I help you? I said, doctor, I think that's what I'm here for you to tell me how you can help me. <laughs> right? You know, I mean, I, I'm not going to tell you how to do your job. Uh, by the way, we shouldn't tell God either. Amen. When you come to the great physician, why don't you say, God, what do I need? And he'll take care of those needs. Sometimes we have needs we don't know we need. Some things we think we're okay, and God says, no, you're not okay, but you've come to the right place. I have the force to take any illness out of your body. I have the force to put any family back together. I have the force to turn this world upside down. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. He says, I've got it. Don't you want it? Then you got to get on course. You got to stay the course because he has what you need. Walk with God. If you're not walking with God, you're walking in the wrong direction. Amen. Walking with God's good spiritually. Yeah, this, this sin will keep you from the book or the book will keep you from sin. And we need that. So, if you ever wonder why our society is so messed up, bombed Israel, did they not? 3,000 missiles came there just a day ago. Boy, it's so prophetic, isn't it? Our world's going to hell in a handbasket. Don't tell me what a handbasket is because I don't know. <laughs> but we're going there. But God still can do something. He can do something in your life. He can do something in His church. But if He doesn't, and He said, I've had it, like He did in the days of Noah, He said, I'm coming back. <laughs> when he comes back, folks, what is he going to say? What he's already said through the Bible. Are you with me? Come up hither. Man, I don't know if you've been practicing, but you better get ready. He's coming, man. He's coming. And when you get ready to go, it's not a whole dictionary. It's three words. Come up hither. And boy, we're there. Um. I don't know when to say this and how to say it. And there'll be times that you'll think that, you know, you'll look at a picture of us and go, I'm glad they're gone. <laughs> or you'll look at a picture of us and wish we were back. Sorry, brother. You say, what's the deal? Because, you know, we're all going to be together in heaven if you know him. Amen. Friends, I got three words for you. Are you ready? See you later. Amen. See you later. It'll be here, there, or up there. Amen. Hey, look. Get this. These are not just words. These are not just words we say. This is what we believe. And if you believe like me, then you know that our future is pretty bright. And you know it won't be long that we'll hear that trumpet say, come up hither, and we'll remember the services and the times that we've had together. I've told people this already. I've had a lot of memories from this place, and some of them were good. <laughs> Hallelujah, right? There's always some, and that's a good thing, but I want us to realize if you don't come through Jesus, you can't come. You're not in the family of God. But if you are, then he is the fright force to take care of any need that you have. And then most importantly, he wants you to stay the course. Paul, when he left those people, he says, I know there'll be wolves coming in sheep clothing that will try to devour and separate you. He says, don't let it happen. He says, I know what happens. Don't let any rift come. Stay the course. Keep in the Word of God. Grab all the power you can from God and tell others that He is the right source. Let's pray. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, an invitation time. I've often thought, talked about it with God this morning. I said, this may be my last message here, but this may be my last message anywhere. This may be the last time you hear a message if this is the last time you hear a message when you want to do business with God, so I'm going to pray, and I'm going to ask you to do something like that. I want you to pray and say, God, what is it that I need? And then let God meet that need. 
Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you're a great God. Lord, I ask also that you would continue to bless this place with your power, with your presence. And Lord, during this invitation even, that you would guide us to make right choices. Thank you for the Word of God. Thank you for the friends here. We ask now that you would continue to bless. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand if we would, please. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. And the invitation's open. I want you to come and pray. Man, pray for your future of your church. Pray for what's going on in our ministries. Pray for your family. Pray that everybody's on board. Everybody knows the Lord. Pray. Now's the time. Now's the time. What God has given, what He wants to do. There's miracles.